All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, we have a good one for you. I feel like we always say that. We always have a good one for you. Well, that's what we try to do. That's the whole point. So, yeah, hopefully we have another good one. of these good... times we should open up and be like, what's up, everybody? We got a bad one for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, You're yeah. going to hate it. Uh, pretty marginal coming up, but take it or leave it. <laughs> uh, no, man, we're really excited. We have uh, Ryan Lampers with us from Hunt Harvest Health and Dr. Hillary Lampers from Hunt Harvest, Harvest Health. And we're probably going to talk about things related to hunting, harvesting, and yeah. healthy living. What a great family atmosphere we've had on this podcast. We've had, you know, my brothers on. Now we have f- some family on as guests. It's fantastic. It's just a little, you know, plug for the wholesome family friendliness of the exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it. We keep it. Well, we keep it semi clean around here. Yeah. Pretty darn clean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if you just have me on, I mean, it's just a bunch of hunting talk, but. Uh, you know, when you bring the doctor on, well, first off, she keeps me from saying stupid things, but uh, it just seems like a higher <laughs> really? level. It just seems oh, like very... a higher, much higher level when Doc's on. We you have, we you'll the... learn something about Ryan if he gives me that look. Like that Quit means throwing me under the shut bus. up. That's what that means. He'll be like, because <laughs> mm, I talk too much. He doesn't really talk much, so he'll give me the look of like, "Oh, Ray, you're getting too far into that. Stop." <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying? We have a little, we have the brains and the brawn. Yeah. Behind the outfit. Sure. There you go. Excellent. Yep. So, a continuation of, so we were chatting a little bit before we get, got up here, Ryan, and we didn't really get into it that deep, but you're saying you fast mm-hmm. on Mondays. Now, is this, is this, is this, uh, like for, uh, you know, budget related, you know, or what do you got going on there? <laughs> well, I am missing my garden. So, no, it, so we just, we just started this actually. It, it's not been a thing that we've done for a very long time. Um, we run a podcast and we actually interviewed a guy who is wicked smart, just very intelligent. And he's very into keto. And if you've kind of been paying attention as to like all of the diets as of late, all of the important diets, the ones that are relevant, um, fasting, intermittent fasting, it gets talked about a lot Mm -hmm. and all the benefits of it. And, you know, it's never been a real thing for me. I just always eat every day. I eat like most people, I think. But it just makes a whole lot of sense. Now, the doc could probably go into why, but um, I kind of follow the, the wicked smart people's lead when they tell me that it's important. Um, but I've done some research on it. And so every Monday, every Monday, we call it Metabolic Monday, we just do a fast. And initially, I thought it was going to be really, really difficult, you know, a whole day without food. But actually, it has not been difficult at all. I mean, you, st- you get to eat your meal Sunday night. And, you know, most of your fast is you're sleeping, you know, all night. So you, you gain a bunch of hours there. You just don't eat all day until Monday night's dinner. So one 24-hour session of non-eating, and that's it. And I st- you st- drink a lot of water. You're not probably supposed to drink coffee, but I do. Um, I think yeah. you can drink coffee as long as it doesn't, doesn't have, have like butter and all the other cream, things in butter, it. butter, sugar in it. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Coffee doesn't really have calories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. I drink coffee um, and then just a lot of water. And I do that. Now I'm doing that once a week on Mondays and I'm just kind of building it into your my schedule. And it I feel good. Yeah, I feel uh, real good doing it. Now. So what it does is it does a process called autophagy. And autophagy is a process in which your cells, um, how we've had it explained to us and how I understand it is that if you think about the garbage in your house, you know, you throw garbage, you throw garbage away in the garbage can that's in your kitchen. And then at the end of the week, you take your garbage can out to the big one, and then the garbage man comes and gets it. And it's kind of like taking the garbage out to the street and the garbage man coming and taking it because your cells are always eliminating waste. And if you're constantly um, bringing in, I mean, food can be like a waste product because, you know, you... You digest it, then you absorb it, then you break it down, and then you get rid of the bad stuff and you keep the good stuff. And um, if you're constantly feeding your body, and then especially like nowadays, people are just feeding their bodies not so great stuff all the time, um, your cells don't really get a chance to clean house, basically. Hmm. And there's this process that your cells will naturally do all the time. And that's why intermittent fasting has become so big because it does this process called autophagy, where it helps you without the constriction of or, or the 
the addition of continually adding in calories and waste is that it helps your cells to kind of clean up house and then take the garbage out to the street and then get rid of it. And the longer you can fast, you get more autophagy and that helps protect you from possible things like cancers and other diseases because you're, you're just basically cleaning house more. And so intermittent fasting is just that 12 to 16 hour time per day where you're not eating. And this is like big for keto. They talk a lot about that. So you, you, you don't eat from dinner the next, the first night to more to breakfast the next morning. It's like at least 12 hours. So they do that every single day. But if you did one day a week or even one day a month or something where you give yourself a 24 hour period so that you can get increased autophagy of your cells and basically the garbage can go out and then, um, it just helps to clean up your system. Hmm. Yeah. And I found, um, you know, some exercise along with it. I mm-hmm. thought that would be even more difficult. To yeah, add to I was going to ask right? that actually. So I've been um, the last couple times uh, we live there in, uh, I'm going to say Three Forks, <laughs> even though it's somewhat Bozeman. Um, so we got a nice big hill uh, right out of Bozeman. It's called the M Trail. Most people know the M Trail if you're from Bozeman. So, um, you know, even on those fasting days, I just get some exercise, you know, get 30 minutes to an hour of a good, steep, sweaty hike. And I thought that was going to be harder than it is, but no, it's, it seems to be like I'm settling into it. And It helps it's the process. Kinda, so they actually encourage, if you're going to do that, that you do exercise. So it's it's not like a fast where you're just taking, unless, of course, you're ill and you have problems and, you know, you need to not be overexerting yourself. But mm-hmm. exercise accentuates the process, right? Because yeah. you're eliminating toxins and waste, you're sweating, you're increasing autophagy. And so they are, it's actually it's actually encouraged to do exercise on that day. Um, and honestly, I, for me, I definitely get hungry cause I have a, a bit of a bit different body type than Ryan. I'm fairly thin and it's harder for me. Sometimes are I feel like I'm not thin. You are thin. Uh oh, <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> you look, you look nice. Okay. You you look nice. <laughs> Meaning I just, uh, I'm more adrenaline dominant. I guess let's put it this way. Ryan is, if you know him, he's like chilled out, calm. Sloth he's not. Like. I've heard he's sloth like, sloth like from my wife <laughs> in <laughs> all areas of his life, which makes him a really great is that uh, stock, What's it called? Spot and stock hunter because he's like the most patient person you'll ever meet in your life, oh, okay. right? Seriously. But he also takes years to make decisions and six months to write me a blog and like I mean it can go on from there. But his body type is like that. Mine is more adrenaline dominant. Like we talked about the caffeine earlier. I don't Mm -hmm. do good with caffeine. It's way too stimulating for me. My brain is just all the time. (laughs) So if I don't eat, it's harder for me because I feel like I just burn a lot of calories quicker. But what I do is I just tell myself. It's funny. It's like if you tell yourself you're not going to eat, like, okay, this is the last food I'm going to eat and I'm not going to eat till tomorrow night. It's still difficult you're still hungry and usually it's a Monday. So what does that mean? I'm going to work and I'm seeing like Mm -hmm. a bunch of patients and you need like brain power for that. Thinking a lot, working, doing a lot of mental activity and sometimes physical activity. And, uh, but if I tell myself I'm going to do it, it's not that hard. You know what I mean? It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But if I go to work on a day, let's say I'm in a rush in the morning, I get the kids to school, I didn't pack any food, I get to work, I'm slammed, I don't have a chance, I don't even have a lunch break, I will be starving, I will be cranky, I will not be able to focus, I can't think about anything except when I'm going to go get some food to eat. It's just a different mindset, right? If I tell myself I'm not going to eat today, I'm just going to drink fluids and tea all day long, it's fine. Like now, we have had days where I tell him, he's like, did you do it? And I'm like, I had to eat. Like, I couldn't. Right. And I that's couldn't. usually on a work day where you've got to Yeah, heavy or load. I ate, like, I, I fasted from dinner the night before to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, which is still really good. Right. And I was oh, just yeah. like, I have to eat because I know, you know, my daughter's got dance till 8 o'clock at night. Like, I'm not going to be able to sit there and wait for dinner to do that. But... But it, it's kind of a mindset thing. So people, I think this is where people get really scared about this kind of stuff. They're like, what do you mean? It's got to be so hard. And 
Um, and Ryan can talk a whole lot more about mental toughness than me. Yeah, I was going to say mental. But it, man, you, can, you can work mental toughness into this just, a little well, bit. I, that's because what I was getting ready to wrap in. It's, it's such a test of wills, you know, because I'm still making my daughter's breakfast in the morning. Yeah, so it's I hard. still got like. So you're you know, looking at food yeah, in I'm close still food contact. In we don't face. make our kids fast, it. for those of you out there. No. We don't starve <laughs> them on Monday. Kids are not <laughs> intermittent <laughs> fasting. But uh, no, so yeah, I got food in front of me all day. And. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like testing myself and challenging myself in other ways. Mm -hmm. So this just seems to be a, a little lesser way to do it, but still fun. Mm. A little test of wills. What do you say, uh, maybe both of you could speak to this, or maybe the doc can speak to it better. What do you say to those you know, folks, you're saying exercising on a day where you're fasting is good. You know, there's always those people, I remember from athletics, you know, and I, you see those people where it's like, man, if you don't get in, like, and they just love slamming protein, you know, They're like 30 grams of protein within 30, 30 minutes, minutes of your workout, your workout. you're yeah. not going to build anything, you know, you're, it's like, how does, what do you say to that? Without really getting deeply into the science of it, that a lot of that is kind of bunk. You do absorb a lot of glucose and like carbohydrate right after you work out. There is a f there is a feeding window right after ex exercise where if you get in some protein and then a lot of carbs, so kind of like that's a really great time that your cells are going to uptake glucose. Um, cause you've burned and then your body needs that glucose. So your u insulin utilization and your glucose uptake will be better. So that's like the best time. If you were going to eat like a banana every day, like that's the best time to eat a banana. Cause your body's going to actually take, uptake that glucose. Is that uh, window like right after you work out? It's like out? that 30 minute window. Okay. Hmm. But, but that being said, most people got enough fat. They can live on their fat. <laughs> they are not going to starve and lose their lean muscle mass by not it. eating after one workout. And we have the concept, and this is a little bit different of a mindset. And, and I had this too because I have a nutrition undergrad. And I did some bodybuilding stuff for a while and competition stuff. And it's all like you got to eat every two and a half to three hours you got to take this before your workout. You got to eat this after your workout. Um, you got to eat like six meals a day when you're intense in there. But we also teach people, and I've done this a ton. I mean, I, I used to really preach this is like, you got to eat breakfast. Um, you got to do some snacking. You got to eat a lunch. You got to eat a dinner. And the science is starting to come out that um, we really don't, our cells Again, back to that autophagy thing, we don't really um, clean out very well and get our cell cellular regeneration if we're constantly making our body do work. Because hmm. food is energy, but it has to be broken down into energy. So it takes a lot of energy for your body to break down food to make energy. Does that right. make sense? It's like a cycle. And um, some people like don't need to be eating all that food because they already have so many stores that could be providing energy. Mm -hmm. So the more fat you have, um, the longer you could live without food, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, as you start to starve, you don't have enough fat cells, and then you start to eat your lean body mass, which is protein, and then you steal stuff from your bones, and that's called starvation. Very few people in this country are in starvation, true starvation, but they're, they're also eating foods that are a lot of empty calories and a ton of glucose. Mm -hmm. So they're getting a lot of simple carbohydrate. Well, the best time to eat that is right after you've expended all this energy and you burn that. So your cells reuptake the glucose really well. But most people are constantly feeding themselves glucose. And so what starts to happen is your insulin first gets re resistant. And then it's, your body starts saying, I don't need all this glucose. So it starts to store it and then it stores it and usually mm -hmm. fat cells and then, you know, that kind of thing. And then you see diabetes and you see blood sugar problems and, and there's a whole list of other problems. You see some of that. So yeah, people will say that, but I think that's a misconception. Now, if you're like, have a very high lean body mass, so you are, let's say a bodybuilder, you don't have that many stores to pull energy from. So you do need to, um, you're going to need to consume more of that in that in that window so that you get that glucose uptake and you preserve your lean muscle mass because eventually you will start, and, and actually you've probably seen this, if you go to the gym, you'll see people who work out like all the time. Mm -hmm. Women are a great example of this. 
we're kind of screwed in a way because we have a ton of estrogen and that can screw things up as well with fat deposition. But we need fat because we make babies and, you know, we do a lot of things you guys don't do. So we actually need more fat. But you've probably seen, like, you go to the gym and you see this chick and she, like, is on the treadmill for, like, an hour. Or she's on the elliptical for, like, an hour every day. Or she goes to, like, jazzers, I don't know, jazzercise class or cycling class every day. And she works out really hard. But she's never, like, really lifting weights and she's never doing any weight-bearing exercise. But she does work out every day. But she, her body type never changes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And a lot of people say you get to a place where you start losing weight, but hormonally your body needs a lot of weight resistance exercise to keep lean body mass on. And after a while, if you're just doing cardio, you're just doing these things where you're not getting a whole lot of pressure into the bone and and, and that and like that weight resistance exercise is that your body will actually steal from your lean muscle and Mm. you'll keep your fat. So this is the whole idea of where we use branched chain amino acids, right? So branched chain amino acids help to feed the lean muscle mass so your body doesn't steal energy from the lean muscle. It steals it from the fat. Hmm. And that's why you see BCAs and tons of workout products, and there's all these BCA drinks that's become very popular. But those are amino acids that really require lean muscle mass to, um, to, to help build lean muscle mass. So if you take BCAs, you, you can maybe preserve your lean muscle mass and start stealing it from your fat. And then if you start doing weight resistant exercise, and guys also have a lot of testosterone. So testosterone increases lean body mass quite a bit. So you can see a guy who starts lifting weights versus a chick who starts lifting weights. He can build a whole lot more lean body mass if he does it that way. But, um, and we won't even go into the hormonal actions, but as far as we get back, you, you don't have to eat like you don't have to eat every two to three hours. Honestly, like you really should just listen to your body. If you're like me, you need more calories during the day. You burn a lot of calories just from your work or your job. It's really more about food quality. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. So if you're drinking protein shakes all day, you're not getting food quality. You know, you, you're you maybe getting your protein and you're getting your whatever from that, but you're not, it's not food quality, you know? And so it's like eat, Eat as much as you want in that feeding window during your day. Just eat good food, healthy food, right? Make good choices. And that's what, like our friend Mike, who we did this podcast with and who taught, has taught us a lot about this. It's like, in that six hours a day you're eating, you can, you, you, know, you can pretty much eat what you want. You don't worry about calories, which everyone's stuck on calories still. You don't need to worry about calories, but you need to worry about food quality. So you're mm-hmm. eating your lean meats, you're eating your vegetables, you're getting a little bit of fruit, your nuts and seeds, whatever. You're not just drinking protein shakes all day and then going to like McDonald's and eating that and then right. Taco Bell for dinner. And you're like, vitamins. well, I only ate for eight hours today and I worked out today so I can eat this food. That's not how your body works because right there, your body cannot take the trash out fast enough. And this is where we start to see autophagy become compromised and we start to see other health conditions. Hmm. Yeah, and I heard, you know, going back to that day of fasting and exercising and, and, and what you asked about that, um, Mike addressed that, um, you know, not not eating. He he gets hit with a lot of questions as well regarding not eating after a workout on, on your fasting mm-hmm. day. And, you know, he, he basically explained why you're, just, you're not going to lose a ton of muscle mass. Maybe you're not building muscle that day, but you're not going to burn it up all in that day by this limited amount of fasting if you're a bodybuilder. So, um, and you look at Mike, I mean, he lives this and the guy's pretty fit. The guy's got a lot of muscle mass and, and that's kind of been his. I think his we gig, just so. need to look at, you know, people talk about detoxes and it's like, oh, I'm going to do my January detox. You know, I'm going to buy this, all these expensive products and I'm going to do a detox. And we've been guilty of that. We've done that for years. I mean, I'm a doc. I, I have a supplement thing full of supplements and like detoxifications. If you really think about it, your body's detoxing all the time. And what Mm -hmm. you really need to do is just support your body's detox mechanisms as much as you can. And this is where a lot of people have massive problems. They don't have good detoxification pathways, whether that's from the choices they've made, the stress they're under, genetics play a huge role into that as well. And um, so if you've got good food quality and you're not constantly burden, burdening your body with all this stuff, it's just about keep thinking about a daily, a weekly detox. You're keeping your detox pathways open. Because if those start getting clogged up and you can't detoxify 
the air you're breathing and the water you're drinking and the food you're consuming. Because we don't all make great choices 100% of the time. I mean, here we are. We've been traveling. We're eating. We're drinking out of plastic water bottles. You know, we're eating drinking we had a beer really at good night. Pizza yesterday. We had amazing pizza Delicious. yesterday. So you know, it, loaded it, with gluten. It was yeah. Great. But it's kind of one of those things like we know we're going to do that. And, and so it's about just the rest of the time keeping your detoxification pathways open so you can deal with those. And like you and I, Mark, were just talking earlier about, you know, 20 years ago, we could, after a show, we'd go out, we'd go drink, we'd go play, we'd go eat whatever we want. And the next day we'd get up and we'd do it all again. And now it's like 1030. We all get done with dinner and we're like, man, I can't wait to go to bed. And then you think oh, I'm so old. This is called getting old. And I, th- it is getting older. Your cells don't replicate as fast. But it's also called getting smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because you don't want to go, it's like, think about it, you know, like that takes a lot of detoxification capacity in order to metabolize all that alcohol and to metabolize all the poor food and metabolize all that stuff and then get up the next day and do it over and then get up the next day and do it over and over again. And so I think there's a piece of, yes, we're getting older, but there's also a piece of you're just getting smarter and you're listening to your body and your body doesn't want to go out and do that because you want to get up and work out in the morning. Right. And you know, you can't do that if you don't. So Mm -hmm. I kind of look at it that way too. Yeah. How do you guys then, you know, I, you guys mentioned like a garden and you mentioned like these lean meats, obviously you hunt. So a lot of meat is probably coming from there. How do you guys do the healthy eating portion of it? Like getting good foods? What does that look like? And can I still eat burritos? That's what I really want to get at. Is our lo- youngest <laughs> daughter, our youngest daughter lives on burritos. Like yes. she's three, she seriously wants burritos all day long for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's her favorite food. Just pick far. a healthy burrito. You can make burritos healthy. You know, rice, rice and beans aren't that bad for you. Like, I mean, actually, rice and beans were paired together historically because one has certain amino acids and the other one has other amino acids. When you eat them together, you get all your amino acids. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to eat meat. You could eat rice and beans. And a lot of cultures live on that. You know, they were eating corn, rice and beans, and they were getting enough of their amino acids where they, you know, meat used to be pricey. And the hunter went out and got meat. It wasn't like everybody gorged themselves on meat. Meat was prized. People got meat only so many times, even per month. It wasn't something. And now we think of protein as meat. And especially when you live with a hunter, meat is like a staple of our diet. But traditionally, your body does not need all that meat for Hmm. protein. There's plenty of plant proteins and like I said, legumes and these things that you can bring in. So if you're, if you want to eat burritos, actually a burrito is kind of, unless it's like that burrito you get, that's like this big. Yeah. Uh, Okay. uh Okay. I had one of those. That's just called (laughs) after, after eating a full pizza. Oh, but how old are you? 24. Oh my God. So Jim, that was post the 30 minute window then. Uh, (laughs) yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it was like three beers, a pizza, a burrito, <laughs> and then I woke up this morning and worked out. Uh, <laughs> okay. like, so at this, least you got that in. Oh, yeah. man, this yeah. is the perfect example of fastly replicating cells where he can metabolize these calories and this energy really fast. Okay. And then he can get up in the morning and do that. It's gonna. You may in 20 years realize that's not something you can do. Meaning <laughs> you could eat a burrito, but it would be half the size. You would skip the pizza. You would only have one beer and you'd drink more water. Yeah. And you could get up and you could still work out. And, and that's, that's just the difference. You know, I think it's just more about the amount. Because we have so much readily access to cheap food in this country, we just think more is better. Like the bigger drink the bigger burger, the bigger steak, the bigger burrito. Um, And, you know, sometimes you look at those things and you go to other countries or you go places where that that burrito would feed like four people. That's And they would be full, you know. And we won't even get into the new things that are coming up about leptin resistance and stuff where, where basically people are eating so much that the signal to the brain is shutting off and telling them there's a, there's a hormone you secrete that your brain will actually tell you that you're full. And when you keep overeating, just like insulin, this hormone will get dysregulated and the brain will keep secreting it, thinking that you're hungry, hungry, keep feeding me more. So you see obese people and what's the first thing you think of? They should just not eat. What's wrong with them? Like, Mm -hmm. don't they know when to quit eating? 
they actually have leptin resistance. Their fat cells are now producing leptin. Their brain, they, they're basically hungry all the time. So they're just like you, except they just keep gaining weight. And I'm starting to see that in thin people. And that's because people are over, over consuming and it's messing up the signal. Mm-hmm. You know, like eating is actually a hormonal brain function. Um, and we don't realize that. So it's, it's just about maybe not so much. And then again, back to food quality. And for Ryan and I, you know, we, we eat a lot of wild game, obviously. Yeah. Ryan, um, in Washington, we had a fabulous garden and greenhouses and we did a lot of food preservation and we do canning and we, we take everything that we have from the fall and we eat it through the winter. Um, and, um, and then we so buy we, staples we, at the store. Yeah, you know? we don't we, really have like specific diets. No, okay. a Are diet we, is kind of silly in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's just you're not like, like following, you know, one. I guess if you want to call it anything, it's like a, a real food diet. I mean, right. just cutting out certain things, sugars, yeah. processed foods, stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I figured out a long time ago that just cutting out sugars has done wonders for me yeah you know i'm i'm not the youngest buck anymore um when i was 24 i uh you know i could do anything you felt invincible and then you hit a point where it's like man my joints start hurting like that that two-day pack out i'm i'm laid up for four days and my knees hurt um yeah and in my diet i mean back then my diet was horrible when i was in the backcountry um processed foods back then it was like snicker bars and bagels and everything that's kind of overload of the processed and, and, you know, sugars. And I figured out for myself with the help of my smart wife there that cutting out the sugars alone, the inflammation just, it wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, you know, I'd come away from these trips, able to go 10 miles in, 10 miles out, big pack outs, and I wouldn't be sore for maybe sometimes it was like a week. I hit a point in my thirties where it was rough. Like, especially at the end of the season, like those late November hunts, those last few big, you know, hunts where you're traipsing through snow, packing stuff out. And then I was like beat down for a long time. And it was just because I was inflamed Mm. throughout most of the hunting season from eating garbage foods. So it's just as simple as that. Just eating more real food, cutting out the simple sugars and, and sugars, very inflammatory. And, And that alone, just that one little trick I feel like, like I don't get inflamed anymore. I'm 45 years old now, and I feel great at the end of a pack out. Mm. You know, come back to the truck with a big load, dump it off. Uh, I used to, by the time I hit the house back home, it was like, oh, man, it was like hard to get out of the truck, right? And now I just, I don't get that. And I'm, you know, way more years into this than I was back then when I was feeling horrible, so. Another, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, now you're talking about, you know, like a two-day pack out. But then that's also on top of, you know, hunting for potentially, you know, multiple days before, sure. you know, you get that animal and then have to engage in, you know, that trek back to the truck. You're talking multiple times being miles back in. You know, I guess, you know, I think one thing we want to talk a little bit about here was, and you know, we touched on kind of those topics a little bit, was, you know, hunting harder, mental toughness. But I guess circling back into the dietary component, are there any things that you're doing specifically to... It's, I feel like it's easier to eat right at home. It's still hard. It's mm-hmm. still extremely hard. Like, you know, we're on the road right now. It's harder to eat, eat For well. Sure. Um, it's easier to eat well at your house where you have just a lot more control. But are you able to do that on the mountain yeah. as well? Because yep. it's a heck of a lot easier to pack that Snickers bar. I know oh, because there's generally one in my pack. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. No, it used to be just like hit the store and get some easy bars, Snicker bars, and all that stuff for the for the trip up. So now, um, I've gotten a lot smarter. Um, you know, all my food. I I figured out what works for me. Um, so I purposefully get foods that don't are a little overloaded with sugar. You know, I used to do those. Uh, I think we all did like the oatmeal packets. Mm-hmm. You know, real quick and easy, lightweight. But have you seen that giant chunk of sugar in there, like maple syrup or whatever it is? Yeah, it's the best part. What yeah, are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> it is like I actually take out all the oats sugar, and just eat just <laughs> eat the sugar. <laughs> There's so much sugar in there. Um, so I've cut that type of stuff out. Um, no real sweet sugary bars for for lunch. So the best way that I've found to do that. Now there's great companies out there right now that are making you know like Heather's choice pack rooms and stuff like that where they're not overloaded with sugar they've got a lot of coconut um shredded coconut in there so it's jacked up on you know healthy oils and stuff like that healthy fats so i, I do a lot 
you know, with these companies, but also I make my own, just, I make the stuff that I would eat at home. So, you know, I'll do my own breakfasts. I'll make, I'll do an oat breakfast. I won't put any sugar in it. And I'll just add dehydrated berries. I'll add some seeds, some nuts, some, you know, I'll put some sweet things in there, like some dates, um, maybe some dehydrated pineapple or whatever it mm. is that I, that tastes good. But that's a real sugar. Like yeah. Talking about real food. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Like- and then, you know, you can you can just make it any flavor you want. I love peanut butter, so you can put powdered peanut butter in there, and that that's just makes it really good. And so you experiment with those things like that in the off-season. You figure out what works for you. And going into the season, I'll have totes of food at the ready. So I don't have to worry about food, you know, coming off of a trip. Um, you might have been on an eight-day, ten-day trip. Um, you got all the food at the ready. You don't have to like continually make it during the hunting season. It's better to do it in the summer. And so making, uh, making snacks, healthy bars, like no bake type bars that you can make out of just oats and peanut butter. And if you want a sweet, you could do maple syrup or, or honey or, you know, agave or whatever you want. And honestly, you know, a lot of the bars out there, I don't know about you, but they're so sweet that I just I just can't do them anymore. Even the store bought you know, protein bars that you see, mm-hmm. they're just so sweet and loaded with sugar. So you, it's very very easy. And we talk about this on our podcast. We got recipes up for that stuff. That it's so easy to just make your own. And when it comes to like what I feel is like the most important meal of the day is that, and that's your dinner. That's the one that we all look forward to at the end of the day after working so hard. We have so I've got two dehydrators, um, two nine tray dehydrators, Excalibur dehydrators. And I just make dinners that I would typically eat at home, whether that's like a spaghetti with wild game meat in it. Um, extra, we put a lot of vegetables in. We're kind of in a transition right now. We don't have the vegetables um, just because we've moved, and we're not going to have that um, until this next summer when we're able to get a new garden in. But um, building all these meals, you can get so creative with different types of stews in the crock pot. Dehydrate those meals and chilies, for example. It's one of my staples. Um, chili's a real heavy meat, like bear meat chili. And yeah. It, and just dehydrate those out, and you know what's in there. There's not a bunch of junk. It's what you'd eat at home, and you're good. It's that simple. That's cool. How are you packaging that meal that you're able to, and then being able to take it with you in your pack, and then what are you cooking that in when you rehydrate it? Okay, so, yeah, uh, as far as the packaging goes, I've got a vacuum packer that just, you know, well, you can use a Mylar bag if you want to go to that extreme. Um, I uh, I run a Jetboil Minimo, mm-hmm. and it's just like the the best little cooker I've found because it, it not just like it's not just a big flame thrower torch like some of the um, Jetboils are, but that Minimo it, it like feathers down to nothing. You can simmer food on there. Huh. So a lot of times I don't wait. I don't want to wait fifteen minutes to eat my my meal. So I'll just dump that bag my you know vacuum packed bag of chili for example in the minimo with the water after you boil the water obviously and just simmer it and i'm eating in like five minutes as you simmer it so that's kind of my my cook system is um yeah little that's mylar bags vacuum packed and yeah yeah back down really small i gotta imagine too that when you're eating that way you know that also like your nutrition has to go into your mental toughness as well because i think sometimes people just they break mentally because their mind is too distracted by something else. And I got to imagine that if you're eating super sugary, simple sugar stuff, and you're just tossing your body through that up and down of just like, I'm, I'm super energized. Now I'm crashed. I need more food. Yeah. You're not, you're not throwing yourself through a loop there. That's all taken care of. You can just concentrate on the task at hand. Yeah. Right. And so in, in many ways, it's like sometimes it might've even always been there. It's just, you had to clear your mind. Yeah, you're not going to be very mentally tough if your body is telling you to go home. You know, if it's yeah. just in, it's screaming, it's it's in pain, it's inflamed, your knees hurt, your ankles hurt, that kind of thing. That's just going to pull you off the mountain. It's going to keep you from going where you need to go to get that bowl or that that buck. So, um, yeah, I think diet plays a huge role in keeping you in the mountains longer because you want to feel, I mean, the goal here is to feel as good on every day as you felt on day one. So, you know, we do a lot of long trips now. So we're seven to eight, nine, ten days in on these trips. And a lot of times it takes that long to, whether you're going for like one specific animal, you need that many days to be back there. 
And that's, that's just how many days it takes. And we find that a lot of times it comes down to that last day on a hunt that you get your animal. But if you're bowing out at day five because your body hurts and your diet sucked and you're all inflamed and you just feel like junk, you know, those opportunities are going to get less and less. And um, if you're a public land hunter and, you know, you're getting after it and um, trying to get, you know, a certain age type animal and to try to be consistent doing that, you kind of want to dial all that stuff in and, you know, be at your best on day 10 as you were on day one. Plus, you got that long pack out at the end, hopefully. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I really feel, and, and I'm not a hunter, I just live with a hunter, and uh, I'm blessed to get a lot of meat. Uh, you know, I always have. People ask me, why don't you hunt? And, you know, there's probably a lot of complex answers to that, but one of the bigger ones is, like, I don't need to kill something because this guy kills stuff and he brings meat home, you know? So for me, because it's not a passion of mine, I feel like I get high-quality meat. When I look at this population of this community and I look from the outside as a non-hunter, I would, to me, I feel like hunters should be ambassadors for nutrition. I feel that if you're, if you're killing an animal to bring home supposedly wild, healthy meat to your family, you should, you should really be understanding what that means and what overall nutrition means. Um, and that doesn't just mean meat, you know, that means your vegetables, Ryan and I always call it the other side of the plate is, is Ryan loves plants as much as he loves going hunting, man. He's like, he's either in his garden pulling weeds or planting or babying those plants or, you know, um, loving on his tomatoes. I don't know. Like he loves that stuff just like he loves hunting. And I, I feel like we have such an opportunity as a community to really be ambassadors for healthy nutrition because in the community I come from, which is the nat natural health and the healthosphere, and I wouldn't say there's different aspects to that. There's a lot of communities in there that aren't very healthy either. But people are talking about this. They're talking about, oh, you need to be eating grass-fed meat. You need to be eating healthy food. You need to be eating organic vegetables. You need, you know, all these things. But they're not actually hunting. They're not out there seeing the animals. They're not out there dressing an animal and understanding where the meat comes from. But they know the importance of that, right? They feel like they should understand. They know the importance, but they're maybe never going to do that. Whereas hunters are, like, doing that. Like, you guys are doing that and so I I just always feel like as a community this this community should be just as in concerned about their food as these other communities out mm -hmm. here that like to look down on the hunting community like we should be ambassadors for nutrition yeah um, because we really understand where that comes from you know and unfortunately I I guess it depends on the populations, but it's uh, fortunately it is changing, and I've seen that a lot in the Western hunting. You know, obviously we're Western hunters; we we're we're not the majority of hunters, which is whitetail and Midwest and all that. But I see a big change in the guys that Ryan hangs out with and the people he's communing with. You know, people are starting to care about this stuff because the older you do get, like you're 24, you don't under you, you can't really comprehend 45 or 50 yet. You know. But once you're 50 or 45 or 50, you realize, like, dude, there's more, there may be more years in the past than I got in the future. Like, that old guy, I think Randy Newberg said that to us yesterday. Did you call Randy the old guy? Oh, my gosh. Did I call I him? think that just happened. <laughs> 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 no, I thought I was, it wasn't. There was another older guy we were talking to. And I, I thought he said it, but I realized it wasn't it Randy who said it on the podcast yesterday. Yeah, he, he uses said that I a lot. have more years looking back than I do looking ahead of me. And why would I not enjoy and be happy about every single moment I have out in the outdoors? You know, mm -hmm. and I feel I feel that it's hard to see it at your age, but at my age, I think that it's so vital to understand how your body works and how your body uses food, and so that you can keep doing these things and you can be going out there. And you can be enjoying your trip out there. You know, if your knees hurt and you're a wreck. And, you know, Ryan was an Al a guide in Alaska for years. And that's actually where I met him. We met in a fly fishing camp in Alaska. And I was the massage therapist. And so he would guide these. That's a good that camp. That sounds like a really nice camp. <laughs> 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 well, that was my job, right? So I worked nights because Ryan was a guide. So he would, you know, Alaska is not cheap to fish in, or it didn't used to be cheap 25 years ago. You know, you had to, usually it was like guys flying in, they got a lot of money. They're paying for a week of guided fishing on a, a remote river. And so, but they're older, right? They're 60, they're 65. They want to fish Alaska. They finally get their dream trip to Alaska. 
It's rough fishing, Alaska. Even when you have a guide doing everything for you, you got to get in and out of those well, boats. Well, I mean, sometimes the there's a line for the massage therapist. <laughs> oh, my gosh, and your knee gets sore just waiting there. <laughs> no, but let me uh, tell you. Well, my job who, was to go out and wear these old guys out with a lot of kings and yeah. a lot of fishing. Okay. So then so. you know what happens. They come back. Some of these guys, they're maybe they were a football player in their younger years. They literally have had five knee surgeries. They can get barely get in and out of a boat. They better get their mas- knee massage massage or they're not going to get back in the boat the next day and go fishing and these were i realized working there and seeing all these guys men and women that that had money now they worked their whole life trashing their bodies basically to get to where they are and they're living the dream and they're a wreck yeah and i'm thinking to myself like what's the point of that like what's the point of being such a wreck that now you have the ability to go do these amazing things you have to have a guide pulling your boat around you have to have a guide doing everything for you because you can't even get in and out of the boat very well well. i'll just bring it back to hunting um yeah you know us three sitting here we we know how hard it is on a backcountry hunt it's difficult it's not easy especially like you know if you're successful and you're packing one out you can do that year after year after year after year Eventually, you're going to start wearing your, your body out if you're not taking care of it, if you're not feeding it right. So, I don't know about you, Mark, but I love, I mean, I love hunting to the point that I want to do this until God only knows. I want to be doing this when I'm 80, yep. if, if able. So, um, why not do anything and everything that's going to prolong this thing that I love in oh, the mountains? Man. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want to be that 75 year old guy out there hunting the back, back country in the wilderness and, and, you know, having the ability to still go down in whatever hole I got to go down into to get that elk, right? Um, I don't want to be laid up in my 50s and easily could be if, you know, these, these trips aren't easy on your body. They're not easy on your back, your hips, your legs, your knees, everything. So, um, but I think there's, there's very simple ways to get around that. And it allows a guy like me to be able to do this for so many more years. And it's very simple, and it's just, you know, taking care of yourself and, and eating right and diet. And Food is your best medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can go to the doctor and get pills and stuff that work really quick and make you think that they're making you better. They're just higher force, and that's why they have side effects. But diet is, like, the foundational medicine. It takes longer. But you do it every single day of your entire life. Like, you will eat every single day of your life. So if you can make more good choices instead of the wrong choices... That is like you're basically giving your body a medicine that will last the long term. Hmm. It's like that's cool. We're it's like at it. diesel medicine, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, and, and it probably you know when I was thinking about you in the backcountry, you know, and Jim was talking about you know wow, spiking you your brought blood. up the oh my essential car reference. <laughs> Jim, you're 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 rubbing <laughs> off on me. Yeah, yeah. For you, you guys, Jim's a big car guy, oh, so okay. I almost always bring up a car reference. Every podcast. But Mark did it this time. <laughs> so, <laughs> what the heck is going on here? Have you seen that movie, Trading Place? Um, but, uh, Freaky Friday? <laughs> but, yeah, you're talking about, you know, spiking it and this, that, the other. And I feel like, you know, in the backcountry, you're talking about being able to go till day 10. And I think maybe a lot of that is just having that mm-hmm. that base built in. And you're not, it's not this, you know, this drag race and then crash. You know, it's just like mm-hmm. chug along, chug along, chug along, chug along, go. You yeah, know? yeah, and when I was young, I'm gonna keep referring to you, Jim. It's like when I was 24, um, I just felt like you do it forever. You just go, 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 and and maybe if you do it hard enough, um, you'll just always be in that kind of shape that you can just continue to do it. It's just not the case. It kind of goes the other way. <laughs> so um, you know, I think I think I would have probably continued to eat like garbage food, just the typical. Um, you know, growing up, it was like just overloaded with sugar and processed foods you know whether that's from like oatmeal in the morning to a couple of bars during the day where there's snicker bars maybe mountain house at night um without my wife's pushing and prodding and like bringing this to my attention like hey you know why you feel garbage it's because (laughs) of this right i probably you know would have just continued to do what i did and you know now that i'm 45 i I wouldn't get to do these big mega hunts where you're back in there mm-hmm. so far and, and, you know, being able to spend time in the mountains. I think, I think that's been huge. And a lot of people maybe don't have that push. Um, so it's kind of nice to like try to educate people on that. Right. Just mm-hmm. like be forewarned. It's not going to last forever if you, if you don't eat right. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, I like, I, so I'd say for me personally, like I'm starting 
to do some of these things. Like I've never eaten like horribly, I guess, but I guess there's definitely periods in my life where I did like so high Mark, school and stuff like that. So Mark, how would you explain your monster days? Okay, I've Uh-oh. had I've had a few uh, <laughs> Mark, setbacks. Mark does monster days where he doesn't eat anything all day, and then it goes to four o'clock p.m. and he's like, "Oh, hey, you want to go get lunch with me?" I'm like, "Well, no, it's four, Mark." And then he's like, "Okay, I think I'm just gonna have a monster and wait till dinner." These are very, <laughs> these are very isolated <laughs> incidents. You're, you're putting I, out his dirty uh, laundry. Uh, yeah. These are very isolated. I've probably had. I don't know. I've seen it. Six, I've seen of the, six of those in my life. Jim's been witness to oh, like three. I was going to dumb it down and how, say yes. Yeah, I just three. wonder how you feel when you do that. Oh, dude, the worst. It's terrifying, actually. I'm yeah, scared. Yeah, like, why would you choose Great a monster big, instead big of, like, go get, like, a smoothie or something? Like, what's with the monster? Because I'm at work. It's been a busy day. And, like, just like you said, it's been a long day. Really, no, not a ton of other opportunities. It, it's fast, and you're like, dude, I just got to gas it up to, like, make it through the rest of the day. Oh, but so then, it's more, like, for energy, mm, not yeah. for food. No, no. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. Like, in I got to say, it does make Mark more entertaining on the podcast. Because <laughs> okay. he comes Wired in, he's up. like, oh, man, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and then we're like, Mark, and then he gets, like, real flustered real easy. and That's good. Yeah, it's like, I, yeah, if you've ever seen a squirrel, like, it's probably like, yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. So. Three under uh, the bus there. Uh, Bam. Um, if I drank a monster, didn't eat all day, and then drank a monster, I would be sitting in the corner hurled hur- up in a ball, shaking and crying. Eyes for wide no open. Reason. Just- and Ryan would be like, <laughs> what is going on? Yeah. And I'd be like, I don't know. Leave me alone. <laughs> I mean, you see kids do it. Oh, like yeah. my my kids was like, mom, can I have this candy cane? And I'm like, sure. And within 30 minutes, she's laying on That's the stairs, though. crying, won't move, no reason, right. meltdown central. So yep. if you don't think sugar has an effect on you, just watch your children when you feed them sugar. That It's just that we're adults now, so we, we act out in different ways. But right. like we don't lay down on the floor and start crying, but you've seen people Jim, like... Yeah. Have you seen Mark <laughs> throw a tantrum on the floor after a monster? Um, not to that level. <laughs> okay. Not, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, Jim, I think hey, Jim, about thanks it. for not talking about that on the podcast. <laughs> Got you, bro. I don't know. I think I just always think back, like think way back. Think way back before processed food and before refrigerators and before. I mean, people lived, millions of p- people lived on this continent before Europeans came. And they lived and they hunted and they lived in the weather and they. They lived usually long lives. They didn't have obesity. They didn't have mental disease. They didn't have these things because they worked hard. Every day was about working and living and surviving. And the foods that they ate were specifically oriented to to giving their body nourishment. And they fasted a ton. Because they didn't have Possibly food. Possibly not, not intentionally. No, but, yeah. but right. that's the whole thing is like now science is saying like, you should be fasting because we're eating too much. But back then, there was no intentional mean to fast unless you were praying or it was some right. sort of spiritual. And we know all spiritual religions have fasting as part of their thing. And it's like you were fasting because you didn't have any food. Yeah. And because you were traveling, you were nomadic. You had to go find the buffalo. You had to go do that. And once you got it, then you could eat. But there was a process, you know, you had to clean it and then you had to dry it and then you knew winter was coming. And so we just don't in this country anyways that we just a lot of we just don't live like that anymore. But if you think I mean these about, folks are probably yeah. only getting what, one monster a year? <laughs> oh <laughs> Mi- Max. <laughs> Max <laughs> one a year. Well, they probably you know, they probably use plants and stuff. They yeah. there were there's plants that are stimulants and do things sure. they knew and they were using they were using things and still, you know, people still like to feel good. Um, but at the same time, like just that's what I always think about. And when people say to me, like, Oh, I can't eat for a day, I'm gonna starve to death and I'm just like you There's win. no perspective. <laughs> There's no perspective. And so you just got to get just a healthier perspective on how easy our life is and that that easiness is actually making us sort of lazy. Yum. And that if you can just have some more of that mental fortitude and do some of these things, it's it's actually improving your body and improving yeah. your long-term health. And another thing is just eat more fats, good healthy fats. People think fat is bad. It's really not bad. More omegas, more omega-3s in your diet, less omega-6s. That helps your joints. That helps inflammation. Mm. Like those kinds of things, you know. Humans are weird how like how they function in how 
a lot of times, actually, for more than just nutrition and things, a lot of times people look back and they try and reference as to like what we should be doing now as to like how people were doing it thousands and thousands mm-hmm. of years ago. And it's like, everybody's like, we're so much better off now than we as humans were back then. And you wonder, our big brains that we have, are they really always having our best interest? You know, it's like, well, we're going to invent all this stuff. We're going to invent processed foods. We're going to invent high fructose corn syrup and this, that, and the other thing. And there's smart reasons behind it, but then there's also really dumb reasons behind it, but that you just don't see it. And then all of a sudden you wind up in a position where it's like, oh, great. Thanks, brain. You got mm-hmm. us here. And really, we shouldn't have changed that from back there. You know, it's, Are we just inventing things for fun? Well, you we know? have like, a lot more people on the planet, and we're creating food for large amounts of people because, like, Ryan and I have a garden back in the day. Like, you had a garden. Like, people farmed. They had their own food sources. They killed their own animals. They raised their own animals. It wasn't like you could just walk to the store and buy every single thing you needed. It's like you... Well, we think we're... Like, what Jim was saying, like, we we think we're so much smarter now than we were back then. But what is the obesity rate right now? 72%. 72%. Wow. I mean, what was it back then? Probably very, very new. So if you saw mm-hmm. someone obese, I'm, I'm guessing just even even prior to post, so post-war era is when we started making all these chemicals. We started using pesticides, herbicides. We started making processed foods. We started doing Teflon. We started making plastics. These were all to make our lives easier. They've, they're basically poisoned us for the last 60 years. And we realized that this hasn't been great for us, but it has made our life easier and it has helped us to live longer, quote unquote. But prior to that... It's like things were just, um, uh, people were healthier in a different sort of way. You know, we, our biochemical process was, we're, we're, we're healthier in a different sort of way. And we've kind of polluted ourselves with, and that means we've polluted our food system as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's something we can't really go back on. Yeah. Unfortunately, you, you can't go back and wish that you could live like the need of Americans lived on the prairie. Like that's just not going to happen. But you, you also got to take into account that when you look at the overall population, how ill people are mm-hmm. based on choices, these are choices. And unfortunately too, these are choices that were made by our grandparents or our great grandparents. We didn't have a choice over that were, have been, passed down through the bloodline and into our genetics now and we're all being influenced by these toxins and these things mm. in our food sources. And we just keep inventing more things to fix the things that we already screwed up. Yeah. And so it's like, all right, let's make another way to screw it up worse but kind of patch yeah. it. Yeah. So it's kind of like I don't know how much smarter we are, you know, but when it comes to food, I think the smarter thing to do is to really understand your food mm. mm-hmm. and to go back and maybe grow some of your own stuff. And like I said, you guys are getting your own meat and I, I even have a hard time eating meat out now. When I go out to a restaurant, I always tell Ryan, like, I'm going to just pick the vegetarian option, you know, vegan option, whatever. Because I know that food, that, that meat that's coming to me in that is mm. probably not the best meat. And I I choose, I want to eat wild game, you know. And, and the more I go out to eat, the harder it gets for me to eat eat even meat out. Yeah. Because it, it, it gets, you know, it's a, I know where our meat comes from in that aspect. And, um I don't know. It's a really complex issue. And, yeah. That brings up... I mean, the 72% of the population is obese. That's 72% of the population that does not understand their bodies. Well, yeah. I was going to say, you know, part of that understanding, though, you know, we've seen this evolution of, you know, processed foods. Like, oh, this is, this is new and this is, like, uh, going to make your life easier and this, mm-hmm. that, the other. But, you know, we've also seen an evolution of information and you know that goes back into um like you said understanding awareness there's so many resources for understanding food and our bodies Mm -hmm. like hunt harvest health for instance like i go to your website i check things out i listen to podcasts i learn about things like though those things didn't exist before either you know like so i look back 20 you know like if i could go back 20 years and no, I mean, I guess I think that's probably everybody as you get older. Oh, if I knew what I knew now, what I yeah. didn't yeah. know then, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, it's it's just well, it's I just think, really cool. I think there's just I mean, you're right. There's so much good information out there, but we got the cards stacked against us because there is always the easy, cheap mm-hmm. option. It it is so easy to get you know cheap, cheap, but it's junk food here in our country. So 
um, yeah, it's always going to be, to be healthy, it's going to be a lot more work. Hunting is a lot of work. Um, yep. whether, or raising, you know, your own meat, that's a lot of work. Gardening is a lot of work. Um, but, I mean, we're supposed to be doing those things. It, we shouldn't, I think a life of ease is creating a laziness. And mm-hmm. I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's creating a nation of inf- inflammation and obesity, yeah. unfortunately. That brings up the point, like, we were talking about hunters should be this, these ambassadors for eating healthy and, you know, because a lot of the the meat that we get, you know, when you're out and you harvest an animal is is healthier than what you'd find at the store if you just went out and, like, like you said, like cheap stuff you find at the store. I think a lot of times you see hunters, maybe they post a picture on Instagram of a steak they just made, a backstrap or whatever, you know, and, and they'll talk about this is organic, this is healthy, and they're right. But I also sometimes wonder, I've said it before, and then somebody might ask me, okay, well, what is it about that that's better than, like, the processed meat or whatever, or some, like, cheap meat you can go and find at the grocery store? And it's one of those things where, in my gut, I know it's better, but I don't know how to explain how it's better. You know, I just think, okay, uh, I guess we're made up of what we put in our bodies, so I, I think that if that animal out there is putting in stuff that's not highly processed into its body, it's probably made out of stuff that's not highly processed, I don't know how to explain to somebody how it is so much healthier. How would you guys explain that? Well, I mean, wild meat in general, it depends though, right? So if we're talking like a corn fed whitetail in the Midwest versus like a grass fed mule deer in the mountains of Montana, like they're going to have two different omega components and stuff like that. Look, probably that whitetail is going to have more omega sixes, which we eat way too many omega corn is basically a huge example of that yeah. we eat way too much omega-6s in our diet whereas maybe the grass-fed high country mule deer has got more omega-3s and we need more of that or it's just like the wild caught king salmon versus the farmed salmon that uh, that king's got tons of omega juice and when you cook it you know the fat white fats bubbling out that's all omega-3s versus if you catch a farmed piece of fit or you and cook ca- it cattle as well you know that's cattle that's kind it's of cattle one. the same cattle that are fed grain versus grass-fed cattle that um their their meat is different so there there are differences and in in species and in animals it can all be different how i like to say it is is that um like it, this is just in our household and everybody's different but in our household i know even though i didn't personally stalk and kill that animal I know what my husband went through to get that animal. I know that I know how he killed that animal. I know how he dressed that animal. I know that he knows the story of that animal and that when he brings that animal home to me, I know where that food came from. It came from a high mountain. It died barely knowing what happened and it, it's respected and that we um, eat that animal and that animal will always have a story. If you buy a steak at a grocery store, whether it's grass fed or grain fed, there's no story for you there. There's no connection to that meat. There's, there's nothing about that animal that you knew or that you, you track through the mountains. It's the same thing. If you, if you have a cow that you slaughter, you probably knew that cow. You, you like had a relationship with that cow or that pig or whatever, you know? And I'm talking small farms here. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. talking mass, like uh, mass farming. And I'm not talking down mass farming because we get a lot of comments from people. Like we, we just choose that we, that is to us, that is going to nourish our bodies more. And um, I feel even the same with the dude who's the white tailed tree tree stand hunter who kills that midwest whitetail even if he is higher in omega-6 you know he killed that deer he knows where that deer came from he brings that deer home his family eats that deer um i I just think that we have lost a lot of context in the whole idea of eating food because we are part of the system we need to eat we are predators we are carnivores you know we eat omnivores whatever you want to call us but like, I feel that for us, that's really important and that so much of the population has no relationship with their meat, like zero. And then they talk down to people like my husband because because he kills it. And it's like, yo. And then if they actually sit down and they listen to him talk about it, their mind's blown. And right. they usually end up going, 
damn, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? How do I learn to do that? And then you realize it's a skill, you know, like what he does is a skill. He's a Western high country hunter. He's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think hard to hunt, like and kill animals, obviously, because we have weapons and we have ways we can do that and lots of different things. But for us, it's about the respect. It's about the relationship. And it's just about knowing that. And in that, I think we get more nutrition from that animal. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, I agree with all of that. And then also there's that component of, um, I think a lot of people want to stay away from possibility of hormones injected, antibiotics and whatnot into animals that, you know, we know that's not in the meat that we're procuring at all, but there's a potential for that in like a big old steak from a restaurant, right? It just happens. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a part of it as well. Well, antibiotic resistance, because these cows, especially these animals that are, you know, they're fed medicine so they don't get sick. A chicken, if you're going to eat, I, I, I'm just going to talk, people are going to yell at me, but chicken's the worst. Like personally, I would eat, I would eat beef steak before I ate chicken. Um, and I only know we lived across the street from a chicken farm for 10 years. We know what happens to these chickens in the mass commercialized farming. But we had chickens of our own. We ate their eggs. Sometimes we ate them. If it was time for them to go, we ate them. So small farm chicken, like I just recommend know a local farmer. Go get your food from people. If you don't want to kill the animal, go get it from people that do and that have a relationship and that these animals are treated in well, a way when that's When it gets humanely. to a point where there's, you know, 10,000 chickens in a, in a cage, antibiotics are requirement. You have or you're going to gonna have it. a oh, die off. Devastating. Oh, yeah. yeah, the yeah. disease. So you ju- just know that that's pretty dang prevalent in most of the chicken out there that you see in the grocery stores. That's just, it just is what it yeah. is. So. You know, and I look at a lot of this stuff as like, I think it'd be difficult in our society and how we live. Like, just not everybody's going to be able to go out. No. You, no. And, and, and you do don't it. want and, everybody doing right. it. Right. And, and yeah. also the resource couldn't support that yeah. either. Right. But, if we can do things, I always call it, you know, we talk about supplements. Like I call it, you know, I think of it as like a very heavy supplement, like as much wild game as I can eat, you know, and, and I haven't been gardening um, where we live now. We just, it's difficult to to do that, you know, but I'm looking in, okay, well, I can have some potted plants or things like that. That's going to supplement, you know, mm-hmm. what I buy from the grocery store. But um, so I think, I think when you scale it back for maybe a person, maybe that come, becomes a little bit more attainable Absolutely. as far as like, you know, kind of dial it back. And then you, there's so much. Um, and again, like I, I'm not preaching because I'm guilty of all these things, you know, but we all are like we have, yeah. um, you know, so much food waste mm-hmm. in our country. Right. And you talk about being conscious of of your food and where it comes from and knowing that story. And like when I have a deer steak on my plate, or a piece of elk, or whatever that is, <clears throat> I'm so cognizant of not wasting that. Oh, yeah. I'm glad, yeah. Oh, you I'm know. glad you brought that yeah, up. Yeah, this Clean is Ryan's pet peeve. Club for Ryan's sure. Ryan's pet peeve is food so, waste. But, yeah. but if it's something else that I don't have that connection to, like, it's f- it's further away in my mind. I, I'll, tell you, I'll a, tell you this right now. If I got a steak on my plate, I don't care what it is. It's going down the hatch. But... <laughs> um, you know, that last my bite of that, you know, burger or something like that. If I'm yeah. full, we you know. have the same thing. And oh, I'm man. even less disrespectful because I didn't kill the animal. So sometimes I'm like, I don't want to eat it. I'm full or I leave some meat out, which you do, and it gets spoiled. I mean, he is like, what are you doing? And so I've become more aware of that as well. Like that meat that has it a story. It hurts like, my soul to see yes. as something that I either killed or, or gardened to be thrown away. Mm-hmm. I, I think <laughs> exactly because you're so, you're so invested in it yeah. and, and you know, and I also think it actually hunting makes me more cognizant of, you know, waste of, of waste or even like, yep. you know, that that cow, whether it was, you know, however it was farmed like it it did have a story too like yeah. it makes it it it's a real thing mm-hmm. it's not just a hamburger we you know? throw away more food in this country probably than we consume we we throw it away we we throw mm-hmm. it in dumpsters grocery stores throw unbelievable amounts of food away so oh, yeah. so you you wonder like it, so say there was a restaurant i mean restaurants throw a ton of food away it's just how it works but if that restaurant was growing their own or they were actually, the chef was out there hunting that animal and whatnot, man, I would think the portion control would be to the point where way smaller portions, where you know everything is getting chewed up, like all, right. all the veggies. 
But right now, you look at portions in a lot of places, and Hill talked about portion control in the beginning there. There's so much food put on a plate. A lot of people can't finish it. I mean, mm-hmm. you eat till you're gorged. Yeah, a healthy you person have, will stop eating it. Yeah, if and their then, leptin works, they will stop eating it. God, but that, my but that, is so screwed <laughs> up. But that food just came in, and there was no relationship there. So it's like it's just garbage. So it fills up the dumpster. But um, no, I think hunters are probably some of the best um, example setters for that because we just, I mean, you don't want to throw it. You packed it out on your back. You don't want to be throwing it away. Mm-hmm. Every little pound mattered. So. Um, no, there is that, and I, I can easily see the other side. If I wasn't a hunter and I just grew up eating food that was cheap and it came from the store, yeah, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to me so much. I wouldn't be thinking about the waste, not at all. But if you grow it, man, just you're, you're like babying you know, your carrots and your plants and your tomatoes and your peppers. Oh, it's it's like a crime if one gets thrown away and doesn't get used or something like you that. You know, when I people when people grow or kill their own food, they they create a respect for food that they can't get anywhere else. And that doesn't matter where you live. I I worked with a I I, I met a guy, knew a guy that worked in Brooklyn. He tore up like they would tear a house down. It would just be like a lot full of dirt and concrete and trash. And these are communities. There's no parks. There's no like. There's no gardens, right? And he would come in, he would take this old lot, he would pull out all the concrete, he would do all that, he would amend the soil, he would get it, the whole neighborhood would come, people would start building, he'd get, everybody would start planting their their gardens in these, like, you know, areas where you just, you know, it was kind of sketchy. People gain respect for their food when they grow it. And by doing that, you bring communities together, you bring people together, and you make people healthier because healthy food makes healthy people. And if you grow it yourself, it's so much more rewarding than just buying it at McDonald's every weekend. It doesn't create it. It doesn't create a community of health. And you can do it like you can do, you know, you can grow stuff on your porch, like you said, or you know, go tear up that old pot plot in, in the neighborhood and see if you can build it. And that's what I hate about neighborhoods. Ryan and I just like, you have to have grass. Like grass is such a ridiculous resource. And like, they <laughs> and don't let people, it. and then there's these rules, grass. like you yep. can't plant a garden in your front yard because it doesn't look good for the neighborhood. It's like, what if the- Now you're going to get me started. <laughs> what if the neighborhood said- Everybody can plant gardens in their front yard and you can grow your own food and we don't want to see grass. And everybody had garden boxes and pretty things and they were growing. And in the summer, it was just like a great permaculture. It would be great. I'd be so stoked. And people would be well, eating usable, their food like grass, and it's usable. Yards give me nothing. I mean, they don't provide anything. So we have... They're a pain like, in the butt. They are. Yeah. I hate No, there are tons of resources, tons of water, tons of work, tons of time spent for nothing. You could have... You could garden that and have food Raspberries, blueberries, yeah. garden boxes, and just like... Flowers that bring in the bees. That, actually give back to you and you can get use out of so much easier than mow, yeah. having to mow grass what a time suck that is i hate it yeah oh. so <laughs> so we have you know the whole concept of like food is is um, and and it's changing all over the place but i i mean that would be my dream is just to drive through neighborhoods and just see people have their yards full of gardens and food that um. they grew and that would be awesome like we would be a healthier country people would like you know if everybody was a small farmer <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> Not mean, a, like a whole farm, but, you know, your yard could be a farm. Oh, absolutely. No, I think about that, you know, and I'm just thinking of, you know, where I live. And I, God, it's the exact same thing. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't have, I don't really don't have a place for a garden. Oh, no, I've got a place for a garden. But I also have a neighborhood ordinance saying mm. I can't turn my front yard into a garden. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've heard there's like HOAs. They, they won't allow you to put. Yeah, raised beds or a hot house, something small, anything like that, which is right. crazy to me. Yeah, I would think that it would up the value of the place. Because your actually, neighbors don't want to look at it. Yeah. It's like, that's so how would, I would rather look at somebody's beautiful garden boxes and f- see their kids out there picking lettuce out and eating it. Like, that's what I'd rather look at than look at your grass. I think you'd be closer. <laughs> to, I think it'd create, like, you know, you talk about, like, a community garden. Like, what if the entire community was a garden? I, I think it would increase... That sense of community. Hey, Bob, what do you got growing over there? Oh, yeah. Your tomatoes look great. Well, you know what? I think people would probably even talk more. Like I, I know a couple of my neighbors, kind of, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah. I think if mm-hmm. you had that common commonality, 
yep. built in. I dream of a day yeah. where lawns are gardens. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Bill, you gave me some of that cilantro. I'm going to say my whole family's feeling a little funny. <laughs> oh, that's a bumper sticker. I like that, Mark. That was good. <laughs> I dream of a day when y- lawns are gardens. Yeah. We're going to make a bumper sticker with okay, that. And we will quote it. you on it. It's true. It's awesome. too bad. It's too bad. You know, you, you got to remember that we weren't built for this type of living that we live now. Mm. We weren't meant to live like this. Yeah. We were it's meant to be, we easy. were meant to be nomadic. We were meant to roam. We were meant to grow our food. We were meant to be in touch with nature and just, we were meant to suffer and we don't do enough of it anymore. So we're all obese, overweight, overbeast. <laughs> we're all obese and unhappy and depressed. And it's too bad. You know, like you said, sometimes it's just, it's, um, it's more just about getting back to that reality of what we need in our bodies. And mm-hmm. yeah. well, to Jim's earlier point, we've outsmarted ourselves. Mm, yes. <laughs> That's true. Done it again. That's true. Foiled. Too easy. Yep. Anyways, geez. Yeah. We went down a rabbit hole today. Oh, that's Holy what it's cow. all about. We can, uh, <laughs> when you say we jump into some last calls here, last calls, basically just anything mildly related that's on your mind before we bring her in for a landing. So, oh. um, let's see. I can, I'll, I'll start out. I'll okay. start out. One, I was going to ask you guys quick, so my last call is a quick question. In order to do this kind of stuff, do you basically have to make this your one and only hobby? Or let's say a guy, so like a guy like myself, I love spending time in the garage, underneath the car, on jack stands, like Mm. wrenching on stuff. If I do that, then I don't have, you know, I'm sacrificing time that I could be spending doing something else. So do you guys do other stuff other than, like, (laughs) I don't know know if that's a rude question, but do you do anything else? (laughs) Yeah, and I'm sure if I let Hill talk about this, she would complain about, all of my hobbies because I probably have way too many Mm -hmm. hobbies but so yeah I mean so gardening it it does take a lot of time it takes a lot of yeah it takes a lot of forethought getting your garden planned out but I think the more you do it and the more education you have and you know just more experience you get to where it's not as time consuming you know once you get your beds in and once you get you know the like watering systems that that take all that time away and allow you to do other things I still have time to go daily exercise and hike and hunt. And I mean, she'll attest, I spend a lot of time in the mountains and yet I'm still able to maintain a garden, find time to put an hour in at the end of the day to can up a bunch of tomato sauce or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Ryan's uh, idea of a fun Friday night is canning potatoes. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's, I don't go out he's a little and he is a wild man. And have fun anymore. I just can potatoes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, it's all, it, if it's important to you, you'll find time to do it. It's kind of like working out, you know, you can make excuses and, and not do it. But uh, gardening is, it doesn't have to be as extravagant as what yeah. some people have. It could be a few pot, pots on the, on the porch, um, one raised bed that has a little bit of everything in it and you don't have to go crazy. Uh, you can feed a, you can, you could feed a family with one garden box, we he goes a, crazy. Like he's we got a half an acre. He grows a l- way more than you we can't can believe eat. the amount of food that you could grow. On. I but, mean, and I didn't even come close. No, to No, we only a used a acre. quarter of our quarter acre. Yeah, half acre. But um, only a quarter. But yeah, of it. no doubt about it. It takes time, um, especially when you get into like we were talking about the meal prepping for big trips and stuff. Um, but it's kind of fun. It kind of becomes another hobby that you like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the food thing. I didn't used to be like a foodie type guy, you know, I just whatever. But now that's like one of my favorite things to do is I like sitting there. I like at the end of it, looking at two big full totes of packaged meals that are ready to go for hunting season. So hunting season is is definitely my number one. Um, And I think all that gardening and food prep and making jerky and all that just kind of ties into the hunt season in the end. And that's my goal. But no, there definitely is a lot of time invested, invested, but I think if you, if you just be smart about it and it's an hour a day or whatever. And you get help like your you wife, does she, mm-hmm. she might pitch, you know, we, we help each other out. We, you know, obviously if he's in the mountains, I got to watch the garden, you know, but it will take a little bit of your tool time away for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I figured. That's what I figured. Yeah. No way around that. But when you eat like your fresh tomato 
I mean, I won't even buy tomatoes now. There's no point in buying a tomato right now at the store for us in Montana. It tastes like water. And so it's also about eating seasonally. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we don't need to eat a bunch of tomatoes. We'll have canned tomatoes that he had from his garden. We eat those. We eat the sauce over the winter. Oh, during the winter and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even if we didn't have that, I'm not drawn to tomatoes this time of year. I don't want to eat a bunch of tomatoes. And then summer comes, we grow some tomatoes and you just gorge on those tomatoes and you eat them and you get all, you know, you get that. So thinking too about just seasonally, like, you know, you don't need to eat a bunch of foods in the middle of winter that aren't really growing where you live in the middle of winter. So, you know, you're eating more stews and, you know, your meats and your potatoes and your stuff like that in the winter. And then summer comes and you, you know, you got, you're going to have a lot more greens, you're going to have a lot more tomatoes, you're going to have a lot more of that stuff and... And if we're talking about like, for example, like when you're making your own foods, I just thought about this. It's like oftentimes, you know, if you have a family, you make like a crock pot full of stew or chili or soups or lasagna or spaghetti. Um, Just make a little bit more with each meal and take those leftovers. If you have your dehydrator in the corner ready to go, throw them on the dehydrator by morning. You've got two, three racks of of meals. Dang. Um, It's just that easy. And it's like... your prep doesn't have to be super difficult. It's basically what you're eating every day for dinner mm-hmm. and dehydrating, unless you're eating a big steak or something like that. But there's a lot of dishes that you can make where you just make a little extra and feed the family, and the rest goes into the dehydrators, and that's your, your yeah, meal prep stew, for the hunting season. Yeah, we do chili, so. spaghettis, quinoa dishes, rice dishes, curry Stir dishes, fries. and we just yeah. dehydrate the leftovers, and you got your meals for the backcountry. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a big time. So you're taking something that in. was going to be like a separate to do, mm-hmm. yeah, and you've kind of already done mm-hmm. the yeah. hard part. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like absolutely. It. Mark, man, my last call is. I mean, when we jumped into this deal and kicked it off, we <laughs> had a wide array of things we talked or could have talked about. And honestly, we talked about a lot of stuff that I didn't think we were going to talk about. (laughs) So now we've got a lot left to talk about that I'm super excited about. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. we didn't even, you know, we're talking about, you know, more, you know, we got a lot into the nutrition side and food side. We didn't really even get into the hunt side that Mm -hmm. much. So I guess I'm super pumped and looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I need to get a rototiller to till up my lawn. I got to say, yeah. And just pay the fee. (laughs) (laughs) Like I remember, I've told you about, I remember back when I was in, in school and I was running, like running competitively. Like I went full hog into eating super healthy and then Mm -hmm. wound up getting out of school and then getting married. Then I had for a while, like a three, like, what was it? Two hour commute for a while. So I got lazy and then kind of jumped out of that. But it's like, this is, this is exciting to get back into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lifestyle for us. It's not a diet. Mm -hmm. Just make it a lifestyle, you know, and diets come and go, but really just choose more real food. Most of the time, decrease your, your portions a little bit, eat when you're hungry and and food quality and and then fast once in a while. You don't have to be perfect 100% of the time. I know. uh, And drink more water. (laughs) It's funny. Like, you know, we talk talk health food a lot. And, um, you know, I, like, I think he'll mention this, but we're guilty. We we just had a great pizza yesterday. I had a guy call me out the other day because he, uh, he saw me at this little, uh, there's this little tiny town in, in Western Montana. And I picked up like a huckleberry shake. It was like the end of hunting season. It was like, you know, just this small little fast food place. It wasn't fast food, but it was like a diner. And it's like, he acted as if it was like this huge deal. He that, called him out on social that, media that, that he saw him there. That I, a shake. I preach healthy, but I, I like treats. I like, you know, we'll splurge on occasion. Um, there's cheat days all the time. Um, you know, we take our daughters out, they eat popcorn and pizza and it doesn't have to be all the time, still make it fun, but mm-hmm. just, you know, reel it in, keep it, you know, at a minimum and yeah, and enjoy it. But yeah. it doesn't have to be completely all in 100% of the time. Never have a beer. It's never. hard to do that in this culture too. I mean, try to like stay away from anything. Like you could never eat out. You, you, you literally couldn't go. I mean, there's so many social things with food. Oh, you I can't mean, go to your friend's house. You can't hardly. do anything. You'd be home. Like, I mean, and what fun is that? Like, you do right. need to have a life. Yeah, you're just, not going to go, like, watch a football game on a Sunday and eat salad. You're just not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that is true. Well, I'm sure back in the day there were cheat days, I too. When you found, you found a, you know... Uh, oh, some honeybees. I'm sure oh, that was a pretty big uh, They were big cheat day. on honey. They were mm. having a party. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. It's part of food. I like it. What okay. are you going to say, Jim? You're going to say something I cut you off. 
I don't even remember. Because just, I just, I should stop. I, I shouldn't ruin our guests' last calls, Mark. Remember? Oh, we talked about this. We talked about this. Well, well that's good. Yeah, that, yeah, I I thought we were going to be talking about hunting, but uh, wow. I guess. it was weaked I didn't in even there. Think yeah, a little be bit. On here. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, if you wouldn't have been on here, we would have had like a lot less really interesting information <laughs> from a doctor. Yeah, it would have been just a lot of boring hunt talk from me. But <laughs> no, that wouldn't be boring. That's what we'll have to we'll have to have you guys on again sometime. Absolutely. Yep. But no, sweet guys. I mean, we appreciate the time. Uh, it was awesome. If anybody listens to this and wants to learn more, find out more, listen to more, check out Hunt Harvest Health. You guys have the website. You have your podcast with all sorts of uh, additional topics and probably some of this, you know, even covered more in depth. And mm-hmm. Yeah, we got it all on there. Recipes. And we do have an ebook that has a lot of these recipes in Uh-oh. it. It's on the website, too. You can buy. Awesome. If you want to start dehydrating, canning, and spending all your Friday nights doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no more working on cars. Can't wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Yep. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.